Hey everybody, welcome to our virtual classroom. We are ready to do lesson four in our Miss, Messiah's Misfits series. Before we get to our two new apostles that we're going to talk about today, let's quickly review the three apostles that we've already talked about. Who remembers the first apostle we talked about? And here's a hint for you. This apostle is always listed first in the lists when you find when you find lists of the apostles in the Bible and he comes first in our song that we learned. So who knows his name? I know you all know his name. Peter. Very good. Very good. Peter was the first apostle we talked about. And we basically learned four different things about Peter's character. And what I really liked about that particular lesson was that those four things we learned all started with the same letter, so it made it easier for me to remember. Hopefully, it helps you too. So let's talk about those four things. Who remembers? Anybody remember the first one? He was, why, why? Yeah, he was curious, right? He was very curious. Always wanted to know the why, wanted to understand. And so hopefully we can be that same way, wanting to know, understand God's word and what he's told us. All right, what was the other thing? He was curious. He was courageous. Very good. When he and John were brought before the Sanhedrin court for preaching Jesus, they basically told him and John, we'll let you go, but stop teaching him Jesus. And Peter stood up to them and said, you judge whether it's right for us to listen to man or listen to God. And so very courageous. He was also, number three was committed. They, he was committed to Jesus, and we read in the scripture where many of Jesus' disciples had been leaving him, and he had his apostles with him, and he said to them, are you guys going to leave me too? And Peter basically stood up and said, no, Jesus, we're not going to leave you. Where would we go? You are, are the Savior. You're the Son of God. So he was very committed. And the fourth one was he needed correction. Don't we all need correction? Because we're all human, right? We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to sin. We're all going to fall short. And that's okay because we're human. And what makes that okay is that Jesus came to die for our sins. And so if we have put on Jesus in baptism, we can get forgiveness of those sins. And then as we go on in our life, we, can, we have the avenue of prayer and we can pray to God for forgiveness of sins. It's a wonderful thing that Jesus came to do for us and that God planned. So those were our four things about Peter. He was curious, he was courageous, he was committed, and he needed correction. All right. So last week we talked about two more. We talked about Peter's brother, Andrew, and then we talked about Philip. So let's look at Andrew real quick. And who can remember something we talked about with regard to Andrew? There were two basic things we mentioned. Anybody? First one was he was not hesitant. He had been following John the Baptist because John the Baptist had come ahead of Christ to teach and prepare the way for Christ. John, I mean, I'm sorry, not John, Andrew <laughs> was one of John's uh, disciples. So Andrew was following the teachings of John the Baptist. And they were together one day, and Christ came by, and John the Baptist said to Andrew, there's the Messiah. And so Andrew immediately left and went and followed Jesus, because that's who he'd been waiting for anyway. So what we can learn from that is, well, we may appreciate a preacher like a preacher better than another one, or a Bible class teacher better than another. It's not the person that we're following, right? What should we be following? We're following the truth. We should be following God's word no matter what. So, And that's what Andrew did. Andrew immediately went and followed Christ. Didn't hesitate. The other thing we talked about with regard to Andrew was that he brought others to Christ. He, we talked about three different classes of people that he had brought to Christ. First was his family, his own family. He's the one after he found Christ, went and found Peter, his brother, and said, we found him. And so he brought his brother and, and other family to Christ. He also brought a boy, a young boy, to Christ. Remember with the feeding in the 5,000? 
I don't know that he was sure what Christ was going to do, but he brought him. And then he also brought Greek, the Greeks who had questions for Christ to Christ so that Christ could answer those questions for them. So great lesson we can get from, from a Andrew. Yes, I'm going to get these names all confused, so just be prepared for it. Okay, so those were some great things about Andrew. And it seems that Andrew was okay. It just, you know, he, he and Peter were brothers. And we look at Peter and we read so much about Peter. Once we get to Acts, wow, it's all about Peter. And so we, we read lots and lots about Peter and John and a couple of the other apostles. And we don't read a whole lot about Andrew. But it's, so it seemed that they were brothers and they had very different personalities as if you've got a brother, you probably have a different personality than them, right? Most most do. My boys are complete opposites in their personalities. It's funny. But it seemed that Andrew was okay with being, you know, maybe uh, quieter than his brother, maybe less in the limelight than his brother. And that's okay because God needs all of us. He needs those of us that are like Peter, who are outgoing and outspoken and he needs those of us that are like Andrew his brother that are maybe quieter that just quietly go about doing God's work all right so now we have Philip we also talked about Philip and we didn't have a whole lot of positive that we looked at with Philip but we do know that he served God we just looked at kind of some of the stories that we read about him and we looked at three different stories we looked at Philip and the 5,000, where Philip kind of lost focus on Jesus. Remember, he kind of lost his focus because Jesus asked him the question, what should we do with these people? And Philip, who had been with Jesus and seen all these miracles and knew that his teachings said, I don't know. I mean, even if we had a ton of money, I don't think we'd have enough to feed all these people. So he was looking at the problem, not looking at the solution. And the solution was Jesus. Jesus could do anything. And so Philip lost his focus. And sometimes I think we do that too. The other story we looked at was Philip and the feast. Where the Greeks had come to Philip to ask him to um, answer a question, to help them answer a question or lead them to Christ to answer the question. And Philip wasn't quite sure what to do. So he went and found somebody else that then ended up taking them to Christ. So he... He kind of was unsure at times, and maybe sometimes we feel unsure at times, right? About what to do or what to say or how to act. And and the last thing we talked about was when Philip and the father was what we called it, I think, on the board. And in that story, we saw that Jesus kind of reprimanded Philip for not being far enough along in his spiritual growth as he maybe should have been. Remember, Jesus was telling them that he was the father, and Philip had said, well, show me the father, and then I'll, and I'll get it. And he said, I've been telling you this. I am the father. I, I, I'm the father. The father is me. We're one and the same. And, and Philip just didn't quite get that. And again, sometimes we are in that same boat, aren't we? We, we may not be spending time with God's word throughout the week. Maybe we just watch this video and then we don't do anything until the next week when we watch the next video. And so we're not growing either. So that's a, the things I like about studying about Philip is I see we can see a lot of ourselves in there. Sometimes we do lose our focus and we don't grow like we should and sometimes we are unsure but guess what? Jesus used Philip just like he used Peter and just like he used Andrew. Very different people, very different personalities, very different character traits. But Jesus was able to use all of them for his glory. And we're going to look at two more today. And when we start talking about this, you might start going, how in the world is Jesus going to use these two guys, these brothers, for his glory? These guys are, well, they call them the sons of thunder, and we're going to find out why. So the two we're going to talk about today are brothers James and John. Let's write them up on the board.
just like the others that we've talked about, let's see, what do we know about James and John? Well, we know their father's name. We know they were the sons of a man named Zebedee. And we know this by looking at Matthew. So go grab your Bibles if you don't have them. If you have them, go ahead and start turning Matthew chapter 20 and verse 20. And in that verse, and you have to you have to read all around it to realize that it's talking that it's when it says, then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, and the sons it's referring to there are James and John. So we know that their dad's name was Zebedee, and obviously we know that they're brothers if they both have the same dad, right? Okay, so we know they were brothers, and we're not sure where they were from. But we do know what they did, what their occupation was. So let's turn to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 20. And you probably already know this. If you remember our first lesson, you should remember what they did for a living. Okay, Mark chapter 1, verse 20. When, 19, let's back up to 19. When he had gone a little farther from there, and he there is Jesus, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending their nets. So what does that tell us? They were fishermen. So just like Peter and Andrew, those brothers were fishermen. James and John, those brothers, they were also fishermen. And that's basically all we know, you know, facts we know about the two of them. Actually, there is one more kind of fact that we know about them, and that is that James and John and Peter, those three, seem to be a part of what you may call Jesus' inner circle. And what I mean by that is it seems that Jesus taught those three apostles in a more intimate way than he did the other 12, right? No, no, if, no. What am I doing? There's not 15. How did I get 15? Am I thinking of the judges? There are 15 judges or, right, 15 judges? depending on what list you look at and how you determine what's judge and what, what's not a judge. Uh, no, 12 apostles, 12 minus 3 would be what? Ah, 9, yeah, I got it, okay. Need to take a math or re refresher course, I guess. Okay, anyway, so they were part of Jesus' inner circle, or they were treated a little bit differently than the other nine. And let's look at a couple of scriptures so that you kind of understand what I mean by that. Let's stay in the book of Mark, where we just turned, and let's flip over to chapter 5. So just a couple pages. And we're going to read verse 37. So Mark 5, 37. And in this situation, there is a, a girl, and a, a, a young girl, I think she's 12, I think that it tells us in here, she has died. And... Jesus heard that she had died, and he said, told the people, don't be afraid. And then in 37, he says, and he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And they went to the house, and they went in there, and he said, why are you guys crying? She's not dead. She's just sleeping. And he goes, and he raises her from the dead. But the only people he would bring with him were Peter, James, and John. So that was an interesting. Now keep flipping in Mark to chapter 9. And we're going to look at verse 2. Chapter 9, verse 2. Ready? Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And this is a situation where Jesus is about to be transfigured, which means his clothes become shining, he looks white as snow, and then Elijah and Moses also appear with him. And But it only happens for these three apostles, Peter, James, and John. So there's another instance. And we'll look at one more. It's still in the book of Mark, so I'm making it easy on you. Mark chapter 14 and verse 33. The context here is, this is the night when Jesus is going to be betrayed by one of his apostles. And they have come to the Garden of Gethsemane. 
So in verse 32, we'll start reading, they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. So he, all the disciples are with him, except for the one that's going to betray him. And he says, you guys sit here while I pray. But then look at verse 33. And he took Peter, James, and John with him. And he began to be troubled and distressed. And he said to them, my soul is sorrowful. Stay here and watch. So he took them further with him and then asked them to stay and watch while he stepped a little further off to pray. So we can see that those three apostles seem to be treated a little differently and maybe um, brought, you know, just taught in a more intimate way than the others. So that's something I wanted you to know about James and John. They were part of that inner circle. But let's really get into the meat of this. And let's talk about, we're going to cover five things about these two brothers. And the first one we're going to see is they were passionate. Passionate. Go ahead and let's flip over to the book of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 9. Luke, chapter 9, and we're going to start in verse 51. Luke, chapter 9, verse 51. You guys ready? Okay. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. So this is Jesus getting ready to head out to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. So he was going to come through this town where the Samaritans were and they didn't want him to come. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? <laughs> so, okay, let's stop there for a second. So here's James and John, the brothers. And they hear that these people don't want Jesus to come through their village. And their first reaction is, oh, all right, let's destroy them. <laughs> let's destroy them They're very passionate about what they thought they needed to do well Jesus had to rebuke them or reprimand them and so if we keep reading in verse 55 it says but he turned Jesus turned and rebuked them saying you do not know what matter of manner of spirit you are of for the son of man did not come to destroy men's lives but to save them and they went to another village so Jesus had to say, whoa, 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 whoa. That's an, I didn't come to destroy people. I came to save people. So they kind of had the wrong idea there of what to do. I mean, maybe their reaction should have been more like, Jesus, what can we do to help these people receive you? What Can we go in there and teach them? Can we go ahead of you and, and try to reason with them? Or, no. What, what would their response? Let's take them out. All right, so... They were very passionate. What else were they? Let's look at the second one. They were very competitive. I hope I spelled that right. Competitive. I think I did. You can look it up later if you think I got it wrong. They were very competitive. Anybody in here play sports? Hmm, raise your hand. Anybody here like to play games? I do. Yay. Uh, anybody here competitive? Ooh, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of being competitive. Actually, I'm, I was so competitive when my kids were a little bit younger that they don't really like to play games with me anymore because I don't really play for fun, they say. I just play to win. So I've tried to get better about that and tried to figure out how to enjoy just the playing of the game, even if I don't win. So I'm still working on that. Just letting you know, still working on that one. But these brothers were competitive. Let's go ahead and turn back to Matthew, the book of Matthew. We're going to go to chapter 18. And we're going to read the first verse. So Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. And that verse says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? 
they all want to know who's the greatest and which one of us is more important than the other. Now let's go to Mark chapter 9 because we're going to we're going to hone more in on James and John here. All right, Mark chapter 9. And we're going to read verse 34. Oops, one more page here. Verse 34. Who is the greatest? All right. And Jesus has asked, he's, he's come to the apostle, he's come into a house, and he's going to ask the apostles in verse 33, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? And verse 34 says, but they kept silent. For on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And then Jesus, and this was all, the, and Jesus had to say, okay, lesson time. You didn't come here to be important and to be put first. You came here to serve. That's why I'm here. That's why you're here. And let's look at one more. And this is where the... What is it? The tire hits the road? I don't know the saying. Anyway, well, if I think of it, I'll tell you later. Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark. We're still in Mark chapter 10. And we're going to go to verses 35 and 37. Mark chapter 10. So we already know that there was some talk amongst the apostles about who's going to be first and who's more important. Well, here we go. In verse 35, it says, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, saying, and that him is Jesus, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. What? <laughs> they were asking that they get to sit on either side of Jesus once in, in his glory, right? They were looking for <laughs> earthly glory. I don't know. They, uh, they wanted to be the most important ones. They wanted to matter, I guess. And if we look back, this story is also recorded in Matthew chapter 20, and you don't have to turn there right now. But what we find out in the Matthew's account of this is in Matthew 20, verses 20 to 24, their mom was involved in this as well because she's, she's the one who says, Grant, she also says, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right and one on your left. So, yikes, they are very competitive. And Jesus, again, had to remind them that you are here, same reason I'm here. We are here to serve, not to be served. So it's not about our importance, it, it's about being humble servants to others. So they were very competitive. They wanted to be the best, the most important. All right, what else were these guys? You see what I mean when I said when we start reading about this, you're going to go, how in the world is Jesus going to use these guys? They were passionate with their passion, kind of uh, misdirected there a little bit, and they were very competitive. Well, let's see what we can get if we look at a third thing. Oh, no. They were snobbish. <gasps> snobbish. All right. You guys know what a snob is? Someone who thinks they're better than other people? Yeah. Well, James and John kind of suffered a little from that. Let's go ahead and turn to the book of Luke. Let's go to the book of Luke, chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, and we're going to read verses 49 and 50. And John, this is John, and he's going to say to Jesus in verse 49, Now John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. So they saw someone casting out demons, and they were like, wait a minute. You're not supposed to be doing that. You're not one of us, so you need to stop doing that, right? Well, let's look at verse 50. What does Jesus say? Jesus said to him, Do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side, right? Jesus had to correct them again and say, No, 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 no. No. Just because they don't walk with us doesn't mean 
that they're not doing the right thing or they're not doing what I've asked them to do. Because we do read about 70 people that Jesus sent out to perform miracles and to cast out demons. So um, they were a little snobbish there. They, You weren't part of our 12, so you shouldn't be doing that stuff. That's for us to do. Hmm. No, no, no. We should never be snobbish about God's word, should we? Okay, well, just in case you were starting to wonder about these two and how in the world Jesus ever decided to call them, we're going to put up number four now. These guys were dependable. That's a good word, right? We're now going dependable. We're not going to look at a, a lot of these scriptures, but if we were to look through the entire book of Acts, we would read about John specifically and how he stood by Peter through so many different trials. We've already, we did look at one when Peter and John were before the Sanhedrin and Peter was the one who said, is it better for us to follow God or man? John was right there with him at that time. So very dependable. And um, we also see that Jesus viewed John specifically, I mean, the both were, but John specifically as dependable because, let's turn to the book of John. Book of John chapter 19 and verses 26 and 27. At this point in time, Jesus is on the cross. And if we read, start in 25, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So there were three Marys standing there. And then in verse 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, and that is referring to John, standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. So Jesus obviously saw John as dependable because he gave his mother's care into John's hands when he was on the cross because he wouldn't be around to care for his mother. So obviously, Jesus viewed them as dependable. And the last one we're going to put up there, number five, is they were devoted. They were devoted. Again, we can look through the book of Acts and other scriptures, and we see that they served Jesus throughout their entire lives. We are going to turn to one scripture in Acts today, and that's Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And we're going to read about James, John's brother here specifically. So Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. So James ends up being the first apostle that we read about who died for Christ. So he was dependable. He was faithful until he, he was faithful enough to where he scared Herod because of what he was out there teaching and preaching. And so Herod had him killed. And then his brother, actually. So James was the first apostle that we read about dying in a, not a natural way, right? He was killed with a sword. But John, his brother, is most likely the last apostle to die. And he's the only one that we know of that died naturally. All the others were, died by the sword or by um, crucifixion or some other not natural way. All right. And, and John... Like I said, so James was the first apostle to die, and John was probably the last one to die. All right, so we can see, right, that they were passionate, 
And while their passion was misdirected when we first see them in that first story about him trying to pass through that city that had Samaritans in it, Jesus saw that passion, I'm sure, in them before he ever called them and knew that he could use that passion for his glory. It just needed to be re redirected, didn't it? They were competitive, which, you know, once they were told that they, they needed to be serving and not looking to be served, he could also figure out a way to use that competitive nature to encourage them to get out there and build people up. They were a little snobbish. Mm. Now that's one I don't know that you can really turn around. You just got to teach them. It's, it, it, we don't need to be snobbish, right? We don't need to be thinking better of ourselves than who and what we are. We need to humble ourselves, right? They were dependable and they were devoted all the way to the end of their lives. So we can see that while at first it looked like, I don't know what Jesus was thinking, when we look at the whole picture, we, we can see that Jesus knew, right? Jesus knows, and he can use anybody. And that's the whole point of this whole study, right? Is Jesus can use anybody for his glory if we just give ourselves over to him. We are all unique. We all have unique personalities and different gifts. And we just need to figure out what those are and figure out how to use them for God's glory. And he will help us do that if we just pray to him and ask him to show us the way. He always will. All right. Yay. I am so excited that um, you guys were doing this study. It's a great study. And I am really, really looking forward to when we can get back into the actual physical classroom so I can see your adorable little faces and we can interact more and have a little bit more fun with our Bible study. But for now, we'll just keep doing it virtually online and it'll get there. It will be there soon enough, right? We'll be there soon. Okay, I will see you guys next week. I hope you have a fantastic week. I know you guys have some spring breaks coming up. So if you have plans, that's awesome. I hope you have fun. And if not, then that's okay too, right? You can still have fun at home. All right, I will see you guys next week. Bye.